don't just miss in rows, you're welcome to get up and go. We'll be singing and playing. Um, and just feel free to go whenever you feel like it. Um, there's, I think, two tables. See one. There's another. Um, and you just tear off a piece of bread, dip it in the juice, um, and have that as communion. Um, you're welcome to eat it there or take it back to your seat. That's up to you. So let's pray um, before we start singing. Lord Jesus, you are our Lord. And we believe that when you died on the cross for us, our sin was erased forever. We come to you knowing that we're, st we're still not perfect. And nevertheless, we thank you that as your children, you take us anyway. You care for us as a father cares for his children. We celebrate communion because you told us to do so. You told us to commemorate what you've done. But as we do it, we also want to offer something to you, which is our hearts. Even if we've offered our hearts to you many times before, we do it again. Because sometimes we're distracted, Father, and we forget about what you've done for us. That's why we commemorate. So just remind us, Father, of how great you are. Remind us of the blood that you've shed for us. And I pray for your overwhelming power to live within us as a result. I pray for this room to be shaken with your presence, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Perfect love could not be 
we're joyful because you laid down your life for us. And we never have to die again. Not truly anyway. And you promised us that we could be with you forever because of what you've done. So we cling to your name, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's the first Sunday of uh, 2018. Woohoo. I want to wish everybody Happy New Year. And like they say in Dutch, big is on time, good health, which I think is the most important thing we ought to have. If we're in good health, we can do a lot of other things. Uh, I'm standing here uh, on behalf of the prayer warriors. We pray for the church. And for the new year, we have certain things we wanted to talk to the church about and hopefully that God can help us achieve those things on his time and watch and his goals. So first, we have a couple of uh, prayer activities that we do in the church. First, we have uh, the Sunday morning prayer meetings that we start from between 10.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. just before the service starts. So we want to encourage this year that everybody should be more involved in praying. But before then, I just wanted uh, uh, Dr. Martin to highlight some two verses I wanted us to just really kind of look into and understand, you know, what I will be talking about. That's taken from the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 29, from verses 12 to 14. So I just uh, hope you can read it and, and try to digest it. And as I talk further on, you can probably get a better insight to what I'm trying to talk about with prayer. And that's taken from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, from verses 5 to 6. So that having been said, like I was trying to say, we have the prayer meeting between 10 30 to 11 p.m. just before the service starts. We want everybody to be deeply involved in that. And then the second Sunday of every month, we have a church prayer meeting. Just immediately after the service, we stop and, uh, and pray for each other, for the needs of the church, you know, for all the things that are happening in the world. And then the last Friday of every month, we have our online prayer meetings. We take this at uh, St. Peter's Carrick, St. Peter's Strats in the Central. So, like I said, we can never overestimate the place of prayer, you know, in the body of Christ. And like we, what we have just read, if we truly want to know God, we can only know Him through praying. And, and like we've been praying in the, in the prayer group, we talk about all the time, how much time we should spend reading the Bible. And that is what the pastor of our church has also highlighted that this year he wants us to spend more time really reading the word and getting to know God. If you want to know him, it is true reading his word and praying that you can really get to know God. So we want to encourage people to be more involved. And I want to talk also that, I don't know if you also have this slide. Starting from this coming Saturday, we'll be praying at the St. Petersburg on Saturday morning from 8.15 to 9 o'clock in the morning. We used to do that previously and somehow we stopped. But it's just so strong in my heart that we should start praying more again. And we'll be doing that the second and the third Saturday of every month. So I also encourage everyone because we thought if we do it in the weekdays, a lot of people are busy. We have to go to work. We have to go to school. We have to do a lot of things. And, but on a Saturday morning, I think after all the stress from Monday to Friday, it's just a time to go back to God and, and relax with Him. And I think be you a mother, father, sons, daughter, colleagues, and friends, no matter what relationship you are in, sometimes you yearn for that loving person where you can go and just pour out your heart because they are willing to listen to you and you get refreshed after such discussion. I think that is the, um, the mindset we should have when we go to pray because the Bible says, greater love had no man than that who laid down his life for his fellow friend. Christ did lay down his life for us and 
there's nothing that he cannot give to us. So for us to be able to really achieve things, we have to be able to go to him and, and pour out our hearts. He's never tired, he's never bored of hearing from us. So we just want to encourage each and every one of us that this, this year should be a year of prayer for us. And uh, it's also my prayer that God gets to open us and give us the understanding that prayer is just more than us asking from our daily needs that we want to be rich, we want to be, you know, have good, good material. It's beautiful. They make our life better. But those are not the most important things that we need in life. That God can help us understand that. That there are more issues going on in the world. We should pray for peace in the world. We should pray for the influential leaders to be able to take decisions that are God fearing that can make the world you know, a more better place for us all to live. That also, prayer is just a time to really also know God. Mm -hmm. That we can go to Him and, and, and pour out our hearts. And that as we get to know Him, we get to a place of knowing that our life is a work in progress in His hand. And as He builds us and we look around, we see that it's not that we are better than the people around us, but that we have become better than what we used to be through His building on us. So that's what I want to say. And I, like I said, I can never, I'm not to preach about prayer, but I just hope that we get involved you know, in all the prayer activities that the church is doing. And I also want to say to the parents, it's hard raising kids and uh, having to leave home to come and pray all night. But in the all night prayer meeting, it's not that you should stay from, uh, sorry, I didn't mention the time. We start from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. So it's not that you stay through the whole night. You can come for an hour, you can come for two hours, you can come for three hours, but it's good to get involved. I hope that it's not just the student and those of us who have been called to yeah, to be in the prayer ministry that prayer is needed by everybody so long as you say you're a Christian. So even if you're a parent, I, I hope God can lay in your heart uh, to work things out. Maybe the mom can come pray one week. The father can come pray another week. And if you're a working person, that, like I said, from Monday to Friday, when you come to pray that God can refresh you, can re-energize re you on how to go, you know, through the other uh, the previous week. So we're just encouraging everyone to be involved. Praise the Lord. I have just two prayer requests to pray for. Uh, one, I think, is from Josephine. She's going for an internship. She wants God to go before her and, and uh, make her internship place favorable where she will be doing the internship. So, Father, we thank you for Josephine. We, we bless her life, Lord Jesus, that as she goes away for the next four months of her life. Father, we pray Lord, that just like we have said on your words said in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, that we should not lean onto on our own understanding, but in all our way that if we acknowledge you, Lord, you will direct our paths. Father, we pray Lord, that you will direct her paths, Lord, that you will go before her, that she will find favor with men, with women, with people she will be working with. The Father, in the end, she will know it was just not the work of, of a man, but that you have done that for her. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Uh, another person asked for a prayer request for, I don't know if it's a friend or a sister, I didn't name Kelly, who is in a relationship that is very abusive and that the, the man is abusing the woman you know, physically and mentally, that God can touch the heart of the man or give the woman the grace to, to get out of the relationship and have a better life and that um, her life can become peaceful. But I will thank you, Lord, for your words. Father, you said we are two or three of us together, that whatever we ask in your name, you will do unto us. Father, we just pray this morning on behalf of uh, Kelly and, and the person is, she's in a relationship with. Father, you said to us, we should love one another, we should love our, our wives or whatever relationship we get to, that if we treat them badly, we are indirectly treating ourselves badly, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray if you want that relationship to go on, give the guy the understanding to know that Kelly is a part of her, a part of him, and it should not be abusive of her. Father, we just pray that you touch both of them supernaturally. Then. Let them also come to know you, Lord Jesus. It's not just that we just sit in relationships that are ungodly and, and, and just sit in the pleasure that we think we get from these things. But I will pray that whoever the, the guy is and, and Kelly, more importantly, that they can see things from your perspective, Lord Jesus. They can see relationship from the way you see it, Lord. That when they understand that, 
they can get better out of each other. Father, we thank you for your grace and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will read some verses from the Bible. It's Luke 22, verse 39 to 26. Then, accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, Pray that you will not give into temptation. He walked away, about the stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray, so that you will not give in to temptation. Hello, my name is Becky Miller. I'm the staff discipleship director here at Damascus Road. As Patrick mentioned, Pastor Matthew and his wife Christine and their kids are away in the U.S. They will be back later this week, so Matt will be back with us next Sunday. With the ushers come up, let's pray for the offering. God, thank you so much for meeting our needs. Thank you that you gift us so that we can bless others. I pray that you continue to use us to meet the needs of the church and to meet the needs of each other and those in need in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't have an account on the city, that's our free communication tool, and you can sign up for an account there, and that's a great way to keep in touch with other people in the church and hear what announcements and events we have coming up. And if you're having any issues with using your account on the city, you can talk to me afterwards, and I will try to help you out. <coughs> Drum returns this week. I see so many of the students Woo! back this week. Welcome back. It's good to see you guys. <laughs> so Drum is this week, Wednesday night, and they're having a special gala night. So that means come dressed up fancy and bring some finger foods to share. At the end of the service today, we're going to have some God story time for you to share your testimonies of what God has done in your life in 2017. So be thinking, if there's a one or two minute testimony that you want to share, um, we'll pass a mic around so you won't have to come up to the front. I'll try to come to you with a microphone, but at the end of the service, we'll have time for that. There's a Surf the City Neighborhood Day coming up on January 27th, so plan ahead for that. And we need volunteers to help with practical work like cleaning, painting, gardening in the Maria Berg neighborhood. You can talk to Ashna right here in the front if you have questions about that. If you notice in the last few rows of chairs and on some of the edges, there are signs hanging on them that say, reserved for families with small children. If you are not a family with small children, uh, next Sunday, could you sit a little bit further forward with parents of small children? Sometimes you have to leap up and go out multiple times. So it's easy if you can sit in the back and the chair. So let's leave those spots open for families with little kids. We are gonna keep track this year of how many different nations are represented at Damascus Road. So starting this Sunday and all throughout 2018, this is a scratch off map. So you're gonna to wanna to run to the back to the greeters table to be the first one to scratch off your country. You might need a coin or something to, to scratch off the covering. Uh, also, next week I'll have push pins that you can put in. So if your country is already scratched off, you can stick a pin in it. So we'll count how many people from how many different nations we have represented at our church in one year. So we'll take this, I'll put it on the greeters table on an easel. And um, you can, then don't sneak back during the service just because you want to be the one to, to scratch it off. But, but go back afterwards. Uh, let's stand and recite the Jesus Creed together. Martin, do you have that slide? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. A key part of growing as disciples of Jesus is paying attention to our emotional health. Jesus is our example in life, including in our emotional life. Now last week we looked at some of Jesus' emotional expressions in the Gospels. 
And if you missed that message, it is on our church YouTube channel, Damascus Road. Jesus felt compassionate love for people that moved him to action. And Jesus felt great joy, and he felt deep sadness. And Jesus felt intense anger, and Jesus felt surprise. Even though he was fully human, and he experienced life as we do as humans, Jesus never sinned by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus always obeyed God the Father. As we heard in the scripture reading today, Jesus felt strong emotions, and Jesus made God-honoring choices. So as followers of Jesus, we need to follow Jesus. And that means we need to become spiritually and emotionally healthy. So we need to learn how to feel our emotions. And also, we need to learn how to honor and obey God. Author Pete Scazzaro has a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And he says you can't become spiritually healthy if you're not emotionally healthy. He wrote, to feel is to be human. To minimize or deny what we feel is a distortion of what it means to be image bearers of our personal God. To the degree that we are unable to express our emotions, we remain impaired in our ability to love God, others, and ourselves well. In other words, we can't live out the Jesus Creed that we just recited if we're not emotionally healthy. We need to be able to tap into our emotions and experience them if we're going to love God and love others wholeheartedly. So think of your emotional life as a bicycle. So you're riding along and everything's going great. And then all of a sudden, your bike starts to rattle, and you're thinking, my bike is not rattling, my bike is not rattling. Are you just going to ignore what's going on with your bike and hope that the problem goes away? Or if you ignore the problem, is it going to get worse until your bike completely falls apart and then you're stuck without transportation? Is the problem the rattling sound in your bike, or is that just a symptom of a bigger problem? It's annoying to have a flat tire and have to walk your bike home in high heels. Done that multiple <laughs> times. It's really annoying to notice that something is not right. You know, you're going across cobblestones and it's rattling more than normal. It's annoying when it keeps slipping out of gear or your chain falls off and you're standing in the middle of the street and it's cold and you're getting bike grease all over yourself trying to put the chain back on. It's really annoying to deal with those problems, but if we don't deal with them, they're not going to go away. They're just going to get worse. And they're going to cost you more time later. OK. So you realize there's a problem, so you get off your bike. And you look around and try to figure out what's the problem. OK. So maybe, maybe you notice that your back wheel is out of alignment, and that's what's causing the rattling in your bicycle. OK. Maybe when I went over the curb and I hit the cobblestones really hard, I knocked my back wheel out of alignment. Maybe this is something I can fix myself. Maybe this is something I'm going to need to call in an expert on. Now, there are some bike repairs that you can fix yourself. You can replace the lights, or the, the batteries in your light, or you can learn how to change an inner tube, which is not easy, and you will get your hands dirty. But if you watch enough YouTube videos and you get the right tools, you can probably learn how to do that yourself. But there are other things. I mean, if you need to change the entire gear system, you're probably going to need to take your bike to a repair shop. So there are times you have to call in professionals to deal with your bike's problems. And then there are times when something goes wrong with your bike, and you can't really figure out what it is. Abby was telling me that she keeps her bike in, uh, in the hallway of her building, as many people do. And every morning when she came out, her tire was flat. And she couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. And there was nothing wrong with it, but her tire kept being flat. Every morning, she finally realized that her jerk neighbor was coming through and, and undoing all of the air caps in everyone's bikes and letting the air out of them just to be a jerk. So she had to talk to the landlord to get this problem dealt with. Now there was nothing wrong with her bicycle, but she's never gonna have air in her tires if she doesn't deal with the root of the problem and actually address the situation that's happening, which is not her fault, but someone else's. 
So our bikes can be a good analogy for us of our spiritual and emotional life. When we feel emotions, they are a signal to us that something is going on internally. We could ignore them, but we probably shouldn't just ignore them and hope that they'll go away. The emotion itself is not a problem, but it's a symptom of a problem. We can learn how to do some emotional repairs on ourselves. We can get better at that with practice. We can learn how to take care of our emotions and do preventative maintenance to stay emotionally healthy. And sometimes we need to call in experts to fix our emotions. There's a bike shop near my house called Defeats Doctor, the bicycle doctor. And sometimes we need to call in an emotional doctor to help us deal with our emotional crisis. Sometimes we have damaging circumstances or destructive relationships that are going to keep us emotionally broken. And if we never move out of those and set boundaries, our emotional life is never going to be what it could be. So like a rattle on your bike, feeling an emotion is a signal that something's wrong or broken or that something's going really well, depending on what kind of emotion it is. Our emotions give us vital information about what we value and what we think and what we believe. And they tell us about our circumstances. Uh, they tell us about what's happening to us and what's happening in us. So emotions are something that are important to pay attention to. When we experience an emotion, there's a lot going on in our body. We're dealing with brain chemicals and thoughts and physical responses. For example, when we're afraid, our muscles tense up and our heart rate accelerates and our breathing might accelerate to get us ready to deal with the threat of the fear that we're feeling. Our face might take on an expression of fear. And our thoughts start racing about the threat and we start trying to figure out what's going on. We might create a story for ourselves explaining maybe the person that's watching me lock up my bike is waiting for me to walk away to steal it. So then we make a choice of what action we're going to take to respond to this fear that we're feeling. Maybe I want to make doubly sure that I've used both locks on my bike, or maybe I want to put it in an, one of those new guarded underground storage bike places in Maastricht to really make sure that it's safe. So we make a choice to respond to what information our emotion is giving us. Emotions are not sins, they're signals. Author Mark Allen Shelsky wrote, the path of both emotional maturity and spiritual maturity can be described as a journey to create a thoughtful space between the emotional motivation and the response. That gap between what we feel and how we act, what we feel and how we act, that gap in there is where we can choose to obey God or not obey. We may feel strong, powerful, overwhelming emotions. And we may have been taught by our culture to feel ashamed of the very emotions that we experience. We may have been taught that it's not okay to feel fear, or that it's not okay to feel angry, or that it's not okay to feel sad. We may have been taught that we need to ignore or suppress those emotions. But that's not biblical, and that's not following Jesus' example. The emotion is not the sin, the emotion is the signal. It's that gap between what we feel and then what we choose to do where we get to choose to follow Jesus. And as we grow mature, we create more of that space in between. Um, if you're someone who's struggled with your temper, like I have, and continue to, something happens, it makes me angry, and I want to immediately lash out. As I grow as a disciple of Jesus, that gap gets a little bit wider, sometimes imperceptibly so, but to take more time in between. I am really frustrated right now, but I'm not going to yell at the person who's making me frustrated. And a lot of times I skip right over that, that gap and I go right into an angry response and losing my temper, but I want that gap to grow. I want to take the time and the space and have the maturity and the patience to choose obedience when I'm feeling emotion, I want to choose to obey God, just like Jesus did. So we're going to look at Jesus in the garden to see how he dealt with strong emotion and then 
worked through that, worked all the way through the emotions and chose to obey God. As we shared in communion today, we remembered Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples. Uh, this is in Luke 22. Our Bible study groups will be up to Luke 22 in just a few weeks, so here's a preview for us as we continue to follow Jesus through Luke over the next few weeks. After that meal together, they sang a hymn, and I didn't used to notice that, but I've been noticing that line lately. And I love that beautiful human moment of these friends singing a song together as they finished their dinner. Then Jesus left, and he went out to the Mount of Olives, or Gethsemane, and it says that was his custom. This was the place he was used to going. And his disciples went with him, and when he arrived, he told them, pray that you won't give in to temptation. And he said, sit here while I pray. And he took three of them with him, Peter and James and John, and he began to feel despair, and he was anxious. And he said, I'm very sad, or in some translations, I'm deeply grieved. I feel like I'm dying. Such intense sadness as he anticipated the suffering that was coming. He said, stay here and keep alert. And then he went a little further away and he <laughs> fell to the ground. And he prayed, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. If it's your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. This cup of suffering, like he had told his disciples during their supper, this cup is the cup of my new covenant. This is my blood poured out for you. And he saw that cup of suffering coming for him, knowing that he was called to go through that suffering on our behalf. And he wrestled with it and begged for God to do it another way. But he said, however, not my will, but your will must be done. Not what I want, but what you want. He was in anguish and prayed even more earnestly. His sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. And he finally dragged himself up from praying and went to his disciples. And they were all asleep. Have you ever felt completely alone? in your suffering. I feel like all of your friends have abandoned you. I am sure that's what Jesus felt in that moment. They couldn't even stay up and pray for me in this hour of my need. They've all fallen asleep. He went to his disciples. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you stay alert for one hour? Stay alert and pray so you won't give in to temptation. The spirit is eager, but the flesh is weak. He wanted Peter to learn how to overcome his sinful desires to overcome temptation. He wanted Peter to learn how to be obedient. Even in his own struggle with obedience, he wanted Peter and his other disciples to learn obedience too. And he left them and prayed again. And again he came back and found them sleeping. And they didn't know how to respond to him. And he went back and prayed again. And then he came a third time. He said, will you sleep and rest all night? That's enough. The time has come for the Son of Man to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Look, here comes my betrayer. And he knew that one of his closest friends, Judas, had betrayed him. Have you ever felt the stab of betrayal of a friend turning on you? Jesus knows that intimately. And he saw Judas coming, who greeted him with a kiss. An ultimate betrayal. Jesus didn't ignore any of these intense emotions that he was feeling. They were so strong that they physically overpowered him. He fell to the ground in prayer. He didn't repress them or pretend like he didn't feel them. He didn't go to his disciples and say, I'm fine. Fine. No big deal. Go back to sleep. Get some rest. I'm fine. He wrestled and prayed and he cried out to God. He entered into that suffering. He didn't put on a happy face. He went through it, he wrestled all night, and then ultimately, he didn't give in to temptation. He didn't give up on his calling, and he didn't abandon the plan. He went through it. He chose submission and obedience to God. 
I've never sweated blood. I've never faced death like Jesus did. But I've gone through some portion of the emotional anguish that Jesus can relate to, as I'm sure all of us have. It's human to suffer. I have wept and begged and pleaded with God. I've echoed prayers of different people in the Gospels. Lord, I believe, but I hope my unbelief. Or, Son of David, have mercy on me. And I've repeated the prayers of Jesus back to him. Sometimes with an angry shout, and sometimes with a whisper. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, where are you in this? And with my face in the carpet, I've prayed, not my will, but yours. Take this cup, but not my will. And Jesus feels that with us. We are not alone when we are in pain, when we are angry, when we are afraid. He knows. Our very, very human Jesus knows what it feels like. And the Holy Spirit is with us, comforting us, just like the Holy Spirit comforted Jesus. And as I've known God better and worked at growing as a follower of Jesus, that gap between the emotion and the choice has grown. Helping me think through what Jesus would do in a given situation. One thing God works in us as we grow as disciples is that obedience. But we don't have to ignore our emotions to get to obedience. In fact, I think we need to learn to feel our emotions more fully like Jesus did, and then work through them to obedience, just like Jesus did. One practice that can help as we're learning how to process our emotions is to journal. So I have these journal sheets for you. If you're not used to processing your emotions, this can take a long time. A lot of us didn't grow up really knowing how to handle our emotions. You know, we learned math and history and civics in school, but we didn't really learn emotional health, at least I didn't always. And so it, it takes a while to learn how to process your emotions, but you can get better at it. Just like you can learn to make repairs on your bicycle, you can get better with practice on processing your emotions. So this is one way that we can diagnose the problem and think about solutions. Because an emotion is... is it's a physical experience as well as being an intangible soul experience. We can start with what we're feeling in our bodies. What do I feel and where do I feel it? Is my face hot? Is my jaw tight? Do I feel tenseness in my chest? Do I feel a pit in my stomach? Am I making a fist? Am I gritting my teeth? Am I shaking? Am I getting cold? What am I feeling in my body and what emotion does that represent? If we're not in touch with our emotions, we may have a hard time naming them and identifying them. So understanding physically what we're experiencing and what emotions that's related to can help. And can I name it? Can I name this emotion? Am I feeling anger, sadness, fear, shame, joy, surprise, or something else? Some people call some of those emotions negative emotions, like they will call anger a negative emotion or fear a negative emotion. I prefer to think of them as uncomfortable emotions. Because I don't think they're negative, I actually think they're really, really important informations. Uh, it, it, they're important emotions that give us important information about what we're experiencing. So I don't see them as a negative, but they are very uncomfortable to go through. So can I name it? You can look up on the internet lists of emotional names and variations of them. There are a lot of different theories of emotion. And so look through a list and identify, okay, what specifically am I feeling right now? And we can think about our facial expressions and body language. Paul Ekman, who I mentioned last week, has done a lot of emotion research, and part of his work has been around micro-expressions and body language. So he has found that there are some recognizable facial expressions for different universal emotions. So when you're angry, you make an angry face. You know, like you, your face kind of draws in, and, and it's tight, and your eyes narrow, and your eyebrows come together, and your lip might curl up showing your teeth like a kind of animal. And so if you feel that on your face and you're not used to identifying anger, you can look in a mirror and say, oh, my face is making an angry face. Maybe I'm feeling angry. Or if we're feeling fear, our eyes get wide and our eyebrows go up and our mouth might open because we're afraid 
And it's like our senses are, are opening up to take in more information so we can identify the threat. And you can learn about body language as well. One time I was, I was standing somewhere and I realized that I was covering my face like this. And I thought, why am I doing this? That's universal body language for shame. Why am I feeling, like, what am I feeling ashamed of? And I was able to investigate what had just happened that was making me feel shame. And my body responded to it even before I was consciously identifying what I was feeling. So you can learn what your body's doing physically as an emotional marker. And you can rate how intensely am I feeling this emotion. Um, as I said last week, that frustration is anger behaving politely. So are you feeling mild frustration on the scale of anger or are you over here at rage? Where on that line is the intensity of your emotion? And then think about what events set this off. Did someone say something to me? Did something happen? Did a whole bunch of events accumulate to make me finally snap emotionally? And what story am I telling myself about this situation? And are my facts correct? A few years ago, a friend was really upset with me about something, and they came and talked to me about it. And they said, no, that, what, what are you talking about? Like, that didn't happen. I didn't do that. They had heard something from someone else that was misinterpreted, and it wasn't true. If it had been true, they would have been right to be very upset with me, but it wasn't true. So sometimes we have to check our facts. Like, our emotion is legitimate. We are really feeling angry at someone. But it might turn out that that wasn't true. So our emotion was true because it reflected what was going on, but our information was incorrect. So we correct the information, and then that adjusts the emotion that we're feeling. And then, sometimes we need to just take time to sit with that emotion and to feel it, instead of running away from it or hiding it or self-medicating with prescription drugs or alcohol or pornography or fun experiences or binge-watching television. Like, what are the things we do to dull our emotions, emotional eating for some of us. What are you doing to avoid your emotion and can you actually just learn to sit with it wherever you feel safe doing that? If it's curling up in a blanket in your bed or sitting in a hot shower, going out in the woods and learn to just sit with your emotion and let yourself feel it. Intense, intense emotions really only last a few minutes. They may come back in, in waves and in cycles. But intense weeping, your body can't sustain it longer than a few minutes. It will taper off. And you may still feel sad and you may have another round of weeping, but it's not gonna last forever. Intense rage, if you can take a minute to take a breath and calm down, the intensity can lessen. So let yourself feel it and remind yourself it's not forever. You're not gonna feel this horrible, all-consuming emotion forever. Just let it happen. And then we can think about what we can do to work through our emotions in healthy ways. The other night, one of my children was very upset. He was screaming and screaming and screaming and kicking walls and screaming. This was like at 11 o'clock at night. And so I wrapped her up in a blanket and we laid down and talked about feelings. What are you feeling? I'm mad. Okay, what made you mad? Okay, what else are you feeling? Might you possibly also be feeling this? And why? And okay. That makes sense. I would feel that way if that happened to me too. Okay, what are some ways you can express that feeling other than screaming and kicking the walls and keeping the entire family awake? And so maybe you need to think about what are some healthy ways you can process emotions. And if you're ever struggling to work through that, um, I'd love to talk to you one-on-one -on -one and, and discuss some ways that might work for you uh, and do some anger work, for example. And you can get your anger out physically, uh, like going for a run, or beating a punching bag, or taking Play-Doh and throwing it at the ceiling or the wall, or going to the cream loaf and buying a bunch of used china and, and smashing it somewhere safe. Not somewhere that you're going to hurt anyone, but physically getting it out. That's okay. It's okay to express your emotions as long as you're not hurting anyone. You know, take a stick and whack a tree. It's okay to get the emotion out of you, to process through it. Then we get to the point where we say, okay, how am I gonna respond? And what God-honoring choice am I going to try to make? And then we decide what action we're gonna to take to resolve the cause of the emotion. Emotion is not the opposite of logic or rational thought. 
logic and rational thought and emotion are both really important in decision making. I read a fascinating case study about a man who had an accident and he had brain damage and he lost the ability to feel emotion. Part of his brain was damaged. And he started making terrible, terrible life choices. He was still very intelligent, he was still completely rational, he could talk through pros and cons, but he made terrible life choices because he had lost his ability to factor emotion into his decision making. Emotion is a vital component of decision making. We saw that it was for the joy that was set before him that Jesus endured the cross. Even his obedience was emotionally driven. So don't think of, of okay, I have to put away my emotions and now I have to think logically. No, I can think emotionally. I just need to think in line with Jesus' emotions, with God's emotions, and make sure that I'm obedient in my action. And I want to say a little more about anger because anger is probably the emotion that is most likely to make us want to sin. Feeling anger is not sin, but there are so many sinful things we can do in our anger. Ephesians 4 has some really useful things to say about this. Be angry without sinning. It does not say don't be angry. It says be angry without sinning. It says don't provide an opportunity for the devil. Don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Only say what's helpful when it's needed for building up the community so it benefits those who hear what you say. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Put aside bitterness, losing your temper, anger, shouting, slander, along with every other evil. Instead, be kind, compassionate, forgiving to each other in the same way God forgave you in Christ. So again, following Jesus' example, Jesus was angry and he acted in his anger, but he didn't hurt people. Actually, it was his anger that drove him to overcome oppression and to work on behalf of other people. Both his anger and his compassion drove him to godly action, and the same can be true for us. And I think one key is to grow in being angry on behalf of other people. Grow in being angry over the things that make God angry. Grow in being angry over wickedness. Grow in being angry over oppression. And work on behalf of other people. And that anger is more likely to be righteous anger than just us being really irritated that someone took our parking spot or, you know, um, <coughs> destroyed our favorite Christmas ornament, which might have happened at my house a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and I went upstairs, calmed myself down, cried, went and got some super glue. And it says to forgive each other. There's so much misunderstanding about forgiveness in Christian culture, unfortunately, and I could do a, a whole lesson just on this I did for my Bible study group. Forgiveness, briefly, means not taking revenge. We know that we're not supposed to take revenge. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. We can trust God to take revenge. If someone does something wicked to us, they will answer to God for that. It's not on us to pay them back for their wickedness. So forgiveness is to say, I will not pay you back what you did to me. I will not pay back evil for evil will do good in the face of evil. I will leave you to God's justice. I won't take revenge. I, I release you from the debt you owe me because of what you did. That's forgiveness. But forgiveness does not mean that there are no relational consequences or physical consequences for, for wickedness. So if someone commits a crime against you, you can forgive them and not go commit the same crime on them, but you also can call the police. Okay, to bring in the justice system is appropriate we're supposed to obey the governing authorities. So, uh, and if someone breaks your trust repeatedly, you may have to distance yourself from that relationship. Not in the sense of, I'm gonna pay you back and I'm gonna try to hurt you, but now I'm gonna set wise boundaries in my life. You're gonna have to re-earn my trust before this relationship can be reconciled and restored. People may need to pay restitution for what they've done. That's a very Jewish part of, of repentance, is paying restitution, of making right, like Zacchaeus, when he had stolen from all of those people, and he decided to follow Jesus, he paid it back. He paid back more than, than what he had taken. So paying restitution is part of it. And so there are real relational consequences. Um, but forgiveness means we, we don't take revenge on them. So part of our anger may be to work through forgiveness and to fight back our urges to seek revenge. We also can validate our own emotions. I think a lot of people in various cultures have grown up invalidating their own emotions. 
um, to say, I should feel something else. I shouldn't feel sad about this. I shouldn't feel angry about this. I'm a bad person for feeling this way. Or I don't, I don't really feel sad. I'm fine. I don't really feel angry. I'm, I'm not afraid. That's invalidation. And that will really mess us up mentally to deny what we're actually experiencing. Instead, it's important to validate our emotions and to say, this is actually what I'm feeling, to name it. And it's okay for me to feel this. And it's normal for humans to feel sad when they have a loss. And any normal person would be feeling the same thing in this situation. Now, I can choose not to hurt myself, not to hurt other people, but I don't have to ignore my emotions to accomplish that. So that's one way we can do emotional repairs on ourselves. And what about preventative maintenance? What can we do when we're not feeling strong emotions to build up our emotional muscles or to keep our emotional bike in good working order? It drives me nuts when I hear someone really suffering and to hear a Christian's response to them be, well, you should just pray and read the Bible more. I do not deny the validity of reading the Bible and praying, but it is not a magic fix for our emotions. There's nothing magical about the act of opening a Bible and reading it, or an act of a regimented prayer life that will actually fix deep suffering on someone. Rather, when we look to the Bible, we can learn from the example of Jesus, and we can learn from how God's people throughout history have dealt with their emotions. Go to the Psalms and read the laments. Go to the prophets and read their weeping and their, their heartache. There's so much in the Bible that we can learn and we can grow, but it's not a magic fix. It's a process of transformation. It may not instantly make us feel better. There's nothing about having a 30-minute quiet time every day that will instantly fix your emotional struggles. But it is important to grow as disciples of Jesus, to learn what God's Word says, and to, to really connect with God in prayer, to relate to the Jesus who knows our experience in prayer, and to ask the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our comforter to be our power for living, to be our power for obedience, just like Jesus did. We need to take time for self-reflection, journaling, thinking, making time to feel. If we're too busy to feel our emotions, they just stack up. If we're too stressed to process, if we don't have time to think, we're going to start making bad decisions. So building time into our schedule just to feel and to think, allowing boredom to do its work for us, those are important parts of emotional maintenance. We need to talk with safe friends and we need to cultivate those safe relationships. Not all of your friends are safe people to share your deepest thoughts with. Be discerning. Know who you can count on to keep your secrets. Know who you can count on to support you. Know who you can count on to not invalidate you, to not shame you when you share the things you're thinking, feeling. And then we need to take time to learn to be followers of Jesus because followers of Jesus follow Jesus, which means being like him. And that means we need Holy Spirit transformation. Ezekiel 36, the prophet tells God's people what God's promise is to them. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your stony heart from your body and replace it with a living one. And I will give you my spirit so you may walk according to my regulations and carefully observe my case laws. That's exactly what we're talking about that God will remove our stone-cold, unfeeling heart and give us a living heart that is emotional and open and feeling. And that God will give us the Spirit so that we can obey God. That's exactly it. To be transformed with an open heart, to walk by the power of the Spirit, and to choose to obey God. And Romans 12 also talks about that. Don't be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. We need our minds to be transformed. Matthew Elliott wrote his doctoral thesis on emotions in the New Testament and published it as a book called Faithful Feelings, and I'm making my way through this. It is the number one study on emotion in the Bible. His bibliography is like this thick. And this is going to be one of my main sources for my master's thesis on Jesus' emotions and emotion and discipleship. He wrote, One cannot change the emotion by dwelling on the emotion itself, but one can change the emotion by dwelling on and changing the beliefs and evaluations that lie behind it. 
the command of emotion is indirect. He talks about where God seems to command emotion in the Bible. For example, love one another. Love is an emotional response. And if we're having a hard time loving someone and we can't really control our emotions, how do we get to loving one another, especially loving our enemies? How do we get to the emotion when we can't really control our emotions? He says, cognition, the cognition behind the emotion must be changed to change the emotion. Emotions tell us the truth about what we believe and what we value. When the New Testament commands emotion, it is exhorting the believer to have the values and beliefs out of which godly emotions flow. So as our minds are transformed, and as we live by the Spirit, and as the Spirit produces fruit in us, our, our thinking changes, and we're more easily able to have the emotional expressions of God instead of sinful, fleshly desires taking over us and controlling us. So as we grow as disciples of Jesus, as we do that preventative maintenance, we will learn to have emotions like Jesus has that care for others, that protect others. So what about the other parts of the bike analogy, like the feet doctor or the neighbor letting the air out of your tires? Sometimes, uh, some people struggle with emotional dysregulation, that their emotional processes are disrupted by things going wrong in their body. <coughs> They're not able to balance their emotions. Or someone's been through trauma, and that has altered forever their perception of the world. Maybe they're dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder or complex PTSD. And they might just be walking along and suddenly a smell triggers their traumatic incident. And all of a sudden, back in their mind, they're back in the middle of trauma. And they're experiencing the emotions of that moment, even though they're completely safe. That's a whole other issue to work through. That's beyond just normal uh, emotional processing. That's that's really needing professional help to work through the trauma. Some people deal with mental illnesses, and that alters your perception of reality as well, if you have a schizoaffective disorder, and you're not able to, to see things accurately, or you have paranoia, or you have an anxiety disorder, and you're constantly afraid, even though there's not really anything to be afraid of because your body is going haywire. And I've seen a lot of Christians be shamed over having anxiety disorders because the Bible says, don't worry, so why are you worrying all the time? But when Jesus said, don't worry, don't worry about what you're going to eat, don't worry about what you're going to drink, don't worry about what you're going to wear, he's talking about kingdom priorities. Don't prioritize those things. Put the kingdom of God first. He's not shaming people with real anxiety disorders. That requires medical intervention to deal with. So if you want to get professional help, for working on your emotions and growing your emotions, there are a few things that you can do. Um, one is to talk to the members of the care team at our church. And I, I know that several of them are here. Patrick and Luke and Nicolette, would you all raise your hands? You can look at them. And Christine also is on that team. And if you'd like to talk to one of us after the service, we would love to set up an appointment with you and talk through some of this stuff, whether it's something severe like mental illness or whether it's just Hey, I'd like to learn how to handle my anger better. We would love to listen and support and pray with you. Now, none of us are mental health professionals. And so if you're dealing with, um, with mental illness or with addiction or a really big life controlling problem, we will still love to listen to you and we will pray for you. But also the next step we're gonna take is to help you see a doctor, to see a psychiatrist or to see a professional therapist, to call in the feeds doctor, to call in the professional who can really help you with that emotional repair more than we can. And if you are in a destructive relationship with a, a parent or with a, a romantic partner or with a friend, and they're just constantly destructive or abusive to you, you're never going to get emotionally healthy without dealing with the circumstances. So we would love to help you take the steps to get out of destructive relationships or destructive situations as well. Maybe it's a boss who's really uh, unhealthy and putting a lot of stress on you. Maybe we can help support you in finding a different job. The last thing to look at is how we can help our friends. Maybe you are feeling very healthy and strong and mature emotionally, and that is fantastic. So what can you do to help other people who are struggling? Most important is to give your presence. It's just to be there with them, to actually spend physical time sitting with them, whether they want to talk or not. Sometimes just the presence of another person is meaningful. Jesus' friends abandoned him. 
when he was in his hour of need. And we don't want to do that for each other. We want to be there. Or maybe it's, it's listening. Um, when I was dealing with uh, going through some grief and dealing with postpartum depression, my friend Gwen gave me the best gift anyone's ever given me emotionally. She said, I will listen to you tell the same stories and say the same things over and over again as many times as you need to do it. Because sometimes that's part of our processing is we just have to, to, to talk through the same things over and over again, looking at it from different angles. And that can get tiring if you're the one listening to it. But the gift she gave me was to say, any time, day or night, you can call me and I will listen to you say the same things over and over again. And her help was vital in my recovery. And we can validate our friends. We can say, yeah, I would feel that if I were in your situation too. That makes sense. Yeah, that's very normal. Of course you feel angry. It's okay to feel angry. They'll listen to our worst horrible thoughts so we can confess all the revenge fantasies that we might be having. And it's okay to say that. It's okay to say, I'm really angry at this person and I want to do to them what they did to me. And our safe friends will listen to that and not shame us for it. And then when we're ready, say, okay, well, we're not actually going to do that. So let's think of some healthy ways to address this. But listen to each other and offer ongoing support. Um, emotional problems are not a quick fix. It may take days or weeks or months or years. Don't ever put a timeline on someone's emotional processing. Um, that will shut them down. They'll know they can't go to you anymore. Don't say, are you still talking about that? Are you still dealing with that? Hasn't it been long enough? Shouldn't you be over that by now? Don't say those things. Just, just listen. So to grow emotionally and spiritually mature, let's feel as Jesus felt and obey as Jesus obeyed. I want to close with another quote from The Wisdom of Your Heart. Unless your discipleship includes emotion, this change of heart surely won't happen. Spirituality without emotion isn't full or healthy. But there's something better. Emotional maturity enables us to live with soft hearts that are able to listen and feel. That come to beat in time with God's own heart, moving us to act in ways that embody God's love. No longer will unnecessary fear bind us. No longer will self-justifying and self-protective anger drive us. We'll be able to truly grieve our losses and release them without bitterness. And we'll be able to feel deep joy, wonder, and happiness. This is the gift God gave us with emotions. A life richly experienced and understood. With wisdom from the heart available for all. May you all grow to feel as Jesus felt. We are going to take some time to hear how God has worked in your life in 2017. Um, well, I'm very thankful um, that, um, <coughs> like Becky just had our sermon on, that we can validate our emotions. And like Becky said, it's, some Christians have learned not to validate their emotions. And I've been going through that for a lot of uh, years, 20 years, 25 years, I mean, a lot of years, and <laughs> 25, I have some sense. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Not <laughs> angry with you. <laughs> Where's the child? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's very helpful to see that uh, Jesus is different, and we follow Jesus. We do not follow religion or what people tell us how we should act as Christians or how we should follow certain uh, rules to be a good example. But it's really, we focus on Jesus and um, I've been, I am still in therapy to validate my emotions and um, a lot of what Becky is saying is also in my therapy. And um, it is very healthy, has been very healthy, healthy for me that um, you can grow while validating your and it also does take time. It, it does take time to sit in it and to realize what am I feeling. And that's, for me, it's a really good practice. I have always been good for other people to uh, help them feel their emotions and allow them. And, but to realize that also I need to uh, put time in it and see God in those emotions. Um, so I'm very thankful that um, I'm now in this time of my life that I really feel that God helped me to go through this. Because in the beginning I thought, oh, I shouldn't do this, and I'm strong enough myself to cope with this. And 
is it really God's way that I go for help? And I'm really thankful that by praying and I trusted God that I could, um, well, take help for myself and take time for myself to process these things. And so I'm very thankful in the sign of the new year that I, well, I see that I can grow more healthy to help myself and others. I think again, for me, it should be in the area of prayers. Because I got to understand that if we are followers of Jesus Christ and it comes to a point in your Christian experience that it becomes more about how you want God to use you. So three years ago, when I started being a part of the leadership of the church, I was like, I've been a Christian for a while, God, I want you to use me in the area of prayer. So, First, I would, like, I would like to say that if you ask God to use you as an instrument in anything, He actually will use you. He will create situations and circumstances to know that if you are really saying that from your heart. So as I asked that from God, I talked to Pastor, uh, Pastor Matthew about it, and somewhere, somehow, God started to bring people into my life that I started to pray for them and, and pray with them, and some of them were really people who were sick, and I also have gone through uh, some sick period in my, in my life. I have issues with my hands, and so I experienced that pain. So I could empathize with them while they were going through. But the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is that God actually brought people in my way, and I prayed with them and got to know them. Sadly, enough, a couple of them were elderly in their age. Some of them had terminal uh, sicknesses. Some of them they died. But in that process, I got to know them. I got to experience their pain even more. And it makes me to become yeah, a more deeply prayerful person. That also when we, like I said before, prayer is not about us. It's about filling the heart of God for other people. That we can intervene and intercede for other people, whatever that situation or circumstances can be. And for those of us who have been to mission trips in the church, we went to Mangalov, and I'm sure you, you, you know the story of Mangalov. It's on YouTube, you can go and check it out. But that as we went there, people from different nations of the world came to pray. Within a period of two years, God transformed Mangalov. So it's just that when we can ask God, use me as an, as an instrument, whatever area you want God to use you, whatever that might be in your heart, God can actually create situations and circumstances to know that if you are really saying that from your heart, or if you're just saying it, we can fool everybody, we can fool ourselves, but we can fool God. And the more he realizes you, you're sincere in what you want, he will, he will give you the, the ability to overcome those things. And without even focusing on your needs, he will meet your needs in ways you don't believe it. He will, he will bring you favors that, that for you, you will say, wow, is this real? And, and I just want to again encourage everyone of us that whatever that might be for you in life, God is relational. And that relationship we can build with Him through reading His Word, through prayer. And when we can do those things, you know, He will care for us. Praise the Lord. I'm so happy to hear the emotions as a subject in the last two Saturdays. I am a Christian since more than 30 years. I never heard this subject in some. Is it perhaps that most of the preachers are men? I have to deal with a lot of uh, emotions, uncomfortable emotions, and I am still in the process. And what Becky talks about her experiences and about her uh, investigation that she does in this matter, I recognize a lot of those emotions. I can feel them, but I, I would not be able to name it. So when she speaks and when she goes through her story, I say, oh yes, I recognize this. And I felt that at that moment. And oh, now I understand why this or that. So I am so happy and I would like to encourage Becky to go on and to speak more mm. and to, to help uh, people recognize
recognize in, 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 in the process where we are going <coughs> So I'm so happy to be part of this church. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy to that I may feel what I feel and to name it and to speak about it. Um, my name is Simone. For those of you who don't know me, I've been here since September. And uh, yeah, 2017 was, I think most importantly, the year after 2016, um, <laughs> which was probably the worst year of my life. Um, but uh, the idea about 2017 is that, well, I'm thankful to God that he helped me achieve some very, I guess, important things in my journey in life. And uh, um, I began the year in quite a lot of pressure to finish my bachelor's. I did my bachelor's in Groningen, and then I moved here to do my master's. Um, and I had extra courses and extra credits to get, and my father had just passed away a few months before that, so I was dealing with quite a lot of pressure to yeah, finish up and also didn't really have a stable um, yeah, financial security to finish my studies. I mean, the Netherlands is quite expensive. And uh, without me really asking for much, God really provided, and he um, kind of just brought the means for me to finish everything on time, to do everything I had to do without me really asking for much or going out of my way to find that, but it was just given to me. Um, and so the first part of 2017 was, yeah, me uh, studying and finishing my bachelor's, and then um, following up on what I was interested in, being a master's here. And so I was able to, yeah, have that privilege to do what I want to do and um, be supported in that. So now I'm here. Um, yeah. I guess um, God showed a lot of provision last year in my life. And um, I want to be thankful for that. And uh, I don't know what 2018 is, but hope it's better than the yeah. last one. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace, which come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, continue to be with us who actively live in truth and love. Have the greatest Sunday afternoon in your life.